Hey guys, Caitlin here. And for this week's YouTube video, I specifically wanted to talk about things that I get confused with in my mind, and that's Kawasaki's disease, scarlet fever, and rheumatic fever. I always get confused with these, especially when I was going through school, because um, they happen in kids, they both have fevers, they both have um, erythematous rashes, they have erythematous throats, and they both have complications of heart disease. So I wanted to go over them and give a quick review of them on this YouTube video. So let's get started. So first let's talk about Kawasaki's disease. So this is a vasculitis of unknown origin and it usually peaks around 18 to 24 months of age. Um, it's rare if you're less than four months of age or greater than five years of age um, and it usually starts off and presents with a fever and a rash and the rash is mostly um, starting in the perineum area and it's usually starting as a maculopapular but it does become polymorphous thereafter so Kawasaki's disease can have a changing rash that's what polymorphous means um, and it has specific diagnosis criteria so those specific criteria include a fever lasting greater than five days and a lot of physical exam findings so you will see that polymorphous rash that and most commonly starts in the perineum area and can spread thereafter. Um, so that's one criteria. And you need four out of the five next physical exam criteria. So one of them is that rash. The next one is conjunctiva of the eyes, so redness in the eyes. Um, the next one is mucose changes, so um, any changes in the mouth, so cracked lips, red lips, um, erythematous pharynx. Um, strawberry tongue. Um, the next one is any extremity changes. So you can have red erythematous edematous hands and feet. Um, and then the last one is that lymphadenopathy that you may see around the neck um, and under the chin area. So this is that exam finding that you may find some conjunctiva bilaterally. It usually spares the um, the limbus area so you can see that here it's usually a little more pale on the limbus area um, and then you can also see some mucosal changing so the cracked lips that you see on this child or the strawberry tongue you see here it's actually quite crazy how much it looks like a strawberry with the papillae sticking out right there and then you may see some extremity changes right here so the edema on these hands or even um, some periungal desquamation so the rash of Kawasaki's can progress. It's polymorphous, so it can progress to desquamation. So you may see that in the periungal area as seen here. So the next thing I want to talk about is scarlet fever. So scarlet fever, um, unlike Kawasaki's, which has an unknown etiology, um, scarlet fever has a etiology that is from group B strep. So it usually presents with a sudden onset of fever and either in anthem or exanthem. So that means any type of mucosal changes. So what you would normally see with strep, so erythematous tonsils, white exil exudate, um, you might see that strawberry tongue or even some Forsheimer spots on the top of their soft palate. Um, or the exanthem, which is the classic on the board, sand fine sandpaper-like rash um, that can start on the neck. Um, you'll hear it starting in the growing of the of the patient and in the axilla, and that's called pastia lines. Um, and then this can progress to desquamination. So when it comes to the treatment of scarlet fever, since we know what causes it, it's group B strep, you're going to treat it like um, strep throat. So either pen BK or amoxicillin. When it comes to the treatment for Kawasaki's, um, it's an unknown etiology, but it's some sort of vasculitis, right? So there's a lot of inflammation. So aspirin is the mainstay of treatment with Kawasaki's. Now, coming off of scarlet fever, we can talk about rheumatic fever. Um, and this is a complication of strep infections. Again, so similar to scarlet fever, but this usually occurs two to six weeks after a strep infection that usually has gone untreated. So um, when you have strep infections, it creates a lot of these exotoxins and the exotoxins can go other places of the body and cause a lot of symptoms and um, some cardiac disease. That's the most serious complication of rheumatic fever. So the diagnosis is mainly based on the Jones criteria. So that's J-O-N-E-S. So J can stand for joints. So a lot of these kids will have polyarthritis. 
O can stand for heart, so I like to replace the O with a little heart. Um, so that's the cardiac uh, complications that you can get from rheumatic fever. Um, N stands for nodule, so sometimes you'll get some nodules on the extensor surfaces. This is the least common finding, physical exam finding. Um, e stands for erythema marginatum, so it has some sort of um, serpingous-like rash over the body, most likely on the trunk. Um, and then S stands for the chorea they can get from it, and it's called Sydenham's chorea, so they can have some jerky movements with their body. Um, and then to make a further diagnosis, um, there's some laboratory markers, so markers, so you can get the modified Jones criteria. So this includes um, laboratory markers that um, just show inflammation, so ESR, CRP that are elevated, and some sort of um, laboratory finding of a recent strep infection or current strep infection. So let's take a look at that. This image of the back of a patient with acute rheumatic fever shows the characteristic rash that I was talking about, erythema marginatum. Note the erythematous lesions with pale centers and a rounded or sapiginous margins on the end. And here's a closer look of one of those lesions. Rheumatic subcutaneous nodules are usually located near tendons or over bony surfaces or prominences. Um, you can see with the arrows pointing to the Achilles tendon and over the bony prominence of the foot here. The overlying skin is not inflamed and typically can be moved over the nodules. The diameter varies from a few millimeters to one to two centimeters. So when it comes to the main complications of each disease, Kawasaki's disease mostly has the complication of coronary artery aneurysms. And then rheumatic heart disease mostly has the complication of carditis. And it can be anything from the outside of the heart all the way to the inside of the heart, most likely um, and most commonly leading to aortic and mitral valve problems later in life. That's it, guys. Thanks for listening. Um, I hope this helps you really differentiate those things in your mind. And I don't know if you guys got as confused about those as I did during school, um, but they have so many similarities that I always got them mixed up in my head. So I just wanted to do a quick review on them. So I hope it helps. See you next Wednesday, guys.